Good. Hey, hi. Uh, welcome to EFF's live stream about net neutrality. I'm Corey Doctor. I'm a special consultant to EFF, and this is our legal director, Corinne McSherry. Hi there. And Thanks for joining us. We're we're talking to you today live from uh, our offices in San Francisco. And we're talking about last week's uh, net neutrality decision and what what uh, will come of it. So, Corinne, can you tell us, like, what is net neutrality? What did the FCC just rule? And what does that change? Okay, so net neutrality, boiled down to its simplest form, is basically a set of rules and principles that say that your ISP, your service provider like Comcast, Verizon... AT&T can't unfairly discriminate in how it handles the data that travels over its pipes. Um, that's really what it boils down to. And that set of principles, net neutrality principles, have pretty much been operation, in operation and shaped um, the internet for well over a decade, and since around 2005, really. Um, and it's really kind of how the internet grew up. And um, in 2015, the FCC adopted a set of rules to codify those principles and make them legally enforceable after you know 10 years of back and forth. So that was great and everybody was happy about that or at least 83% of Americans were. Um, but we have a new FCC and uh, the new FCC um, is chaired by a fellow named Ajit Pai who's been against net neutrality rules from the beginning. Last week, the FCC, a majority of the FCC voted to get rid of not just the rules that were adopted in 2015, but importantly, to get rid of any net neutrality requirements whatsoever. So that's the really radical move. It's not that the FCC took us back to where we were in 2014 before the order was adopted. What the FCC did is said, we don't think we need net neutrality rules at all. Yeah, and I think it's significant that like not only did they roll us back, but they rolled us back uh, in in a world in which the ISPs are really different from how they were when the internet started. You know, I started with dial-up modems and DSL. There were a lot of phone companies in America and a lot more cable companies in America. There had been a lot fewer mergers and acquisitions. It was harder for them to coordinate their action. So it feels like, you know, we had penicillin to fight early germs, and then we developed better and better antibiotics to counter this worse and worse uh, pathogen, you know, this concentrated market power. And now we've gone back to like penicillin, but we've got superbugs. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly, that's exactly right. I mean, it's incredibly ironic that right now is the time when we would get rid of net neutrality, when we desperately need it the most. Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing that more than half of Americans only have one broadband provider. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I mean, the, the, the FCC tries to tell a story that that's not true because you have options beyond broadband. But the reality is, for most Americans, for high-speed, reliable internet access that our companies need and that regular people need to access health information, education, log into school, you know, that's broadband. So does this mean the fight's over? You know, the FCC is chaired by an ex-Verizon lawyer. He comes along and bangs his giant coffee cup and says net neutrality is no longer the law of the land. Do we just go out, crawl under a rock until the next administration turns over? <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, there's actually a bunch of paths forward and we need to pursue them pretty much all at once and we are pursuing them all at once. So first initial path, we need to lean on Congress. Congress has a, um, an option under what's called the Congressional Review Act to basically reverse what happened last week. It has approximately 60 days to do it from when the order is published. That's kind of complicated, but basically it needs to happen relatively quickly. Um, but Congress is already hearing from um, all kinds of constituents and saying, we do not like what the FCC just did. So Congress is going to be under a lot of pressure to, to reverse the FCC's order. So that's job one, and that's pressure point one. And we will be talking with people over the next couple months and giving them ways to make sure that their representative knows. Um, then the second thing that can happen is, you know, state's attorneys general and, and um, legislators around the country are looking for ways that they can protect at least the people in their state. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those options are harder than others, but they're definitely, there's a lot of attorneys generals that are very, very focused on this. Related to that, we're all going to court. I mean, right. there's no question. There's going to be litigation. It's going to take a while because litigation is slow. But there are many, many people who are ready to go to court and challenge what the FCC did. Because basically what the FCC did is it said, 
Everything we said two years ago, the entire world has changed, which doesn't make any sense. And as we've pointed out and other people have pointed out, also if you look at their sort of the evidence that they put forward to justify what they did, just suggests they don't understand how the internet works. So we're gonna go to court and explain how the internet works and we think you know, we can help a judge understand that what the FCC is doing is what's called arbitrary and capricious, which you're not allowed to do. Um, then the last thing that I'm urging people around the country to do is look local. Look local. Lots and lots of cities are interested in creating their own broadband networks. There's lots of different models for doing this and a lot of energy behind it because sort of net neutrality begins at home. And cities, mayors and, and sort of lo local representatives understand that they, just like the states need to protect the people in their state, the cities need to protect the people in, you know, in their communities. Yeah, I think those are all really good points. I remember reading um, Tim Wu, the guy who coined the term net neutrality, he wrote a great op-ed in the New York Times and said that, uh, you know, the Supreme Court says that, that uh, the uh, administrative agencies, they're supposed to act on the base of evidence. They can't just make stuff up. And that, you know, the, the way we know they had enough evidence to make the 2015 order is they made it. And so we're like, where's the evidence that the whole world has changed since? So, you know, that at least gave me a little hope. Yeah, I think it's right. And one of the things that, that we noticed in the order is they relied very heavily to justify the switch on evidence that was put into the record by the ISPs themselves, which mm. is perhaps not completely reliable. Yeah, putting a fox in every hen house is not exactly what we signed up for. That's yeah. right, exactly. So, you know, I, I, I wonder about like wireless because we do have a lot more wireless carriers than wired carriers. And, you know, the argument has always been, well, with enough competition, maybe we the net neutrality order doesn't matter because the, if the cable operators are so crappy that people don't like them, then maybe they'll switch somewhere else. Can, can we just let competition from wireless solve this problem? Well, there's a couple of problems with that approach. One is that um, wireless isn't equivalent to broadband for people in many, many communities. So mm. we're far from being there yet. So that's one problem. The second problem with it is whether it's wireless or wired, when you set up a world in which your ISP, your infrastructure, is a gatekeeper between you and some service that you want, Right? That's not the internet that we've come to, to know and love. And that's not the internet that we want. In fact, one of the things that that's going to do is make sure that people who are worried about you know, big incumbents like Facebook and Twitter and Google being too powerful, um, without net neutrality rules for wireless and wired, you just make sure that they stay powerful because they're gonna be the people that can pay the extra fees to make sure that they can you know, get the fastest access to the subscribers, as opposed to you know the next Twitter, the next Google, the alternative services that we would like to come to know and love. Yeah, I often find out what companies are really thinking by reading the stuff they tell their shareholders. Because yeah. you know, ever since Sarbanes Oxley, you know, executives that don't tell the truth really face both criminal and civil liability. So I, I read with interest when the CEO of Netflix said, you know, back in 2015, we fought really hard because it was an existential threat. We thought without net neutrality. The, the ISPs who own competitors of ours are going to put us out of business. This time around, we're still going to fight hard, but we don't think it's an existential threat to us because we can afford to pay for extra carriage and people like our service. You know, it, it's, it, if it's the next Netflix that we really got to watch out for, not because we don't love getting video from Netflix, but because if we, it, you know, it seems really unlikely that this Netflix is the last great company we're ever gonna have. All the innovation happened 10 years ago and we're done now, right? Right, exactly. I mean, and if you think about, um, we have this political moment where people are quite critical of, of Facebook and Twitter and other platforms and how they handle information. Well, don't you want a world in which maybe you could experiment with an alternative? Yeah. Now, Ajit Pai's uh, at congressional allies like uh, Marsha Blackburn, who's running for the Senate next year, I understand, has uh, ha put forward a bill that they call a net neutrality bill, and they say that it kind of uh, finds the balance point. W what does that bill look like, and is it is it going to address the concerns we have? No, it's not. We're <laughs> that it, it's basically what's happening is that people are putting forward woefully inadequate pseudo net neutrality alternatives that are signed off on by the ISPs. They're fine with them, maybe but um, don't fall far short of what we had with the 2015 order. So the Blackburn bill in particular, um, it does ban throttling, so that's a good thing, and blocking, so that's a good thing. What it explicitly does not ban is paid prioritization, which is the sort of code word for 
creating internet fast lanes. So what it's actually doing is it's making sure that net neutrality protections do not include um, uh, uh, prohibiting uh, internet fast lanes. So it's actually the opposite of what we want. I mean, my view is if Congress wants to step in and do some good here, that's great. But we're not going to accept anything less than what we already had. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I always say it's not fast lanes, it's slow lanes, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's all the traffic is now in the fast lane. Yeah. The way that they'll, the, the, what they propose to do is like, it's like you get in a cab and you say, take me to Walmart. And they circle the block three times because Costco is paid for premium carriage. We may think that Walmart and Costco uh, might be better, it might, might, might be improved by like breaking them up into smaller companies or having more competition. But even so, when you ask the cab driver to take you to one of them, that's where you expect it to take you, not to slow you down because the other one is paid for a fast lane. Yeah, that's exactly right. And really what's going to be in the slow lanes isn't just, you know, services for commerce and so on. It's going to be healthcare. It's going to be access to government information. It's going to be access to job information. It's going to be those kind of basic services that we actually all rely on the internet for every single day. I mean, we spend a lot of time talking that when we talk about net neutrality, we talk about like Netflix and brand names that people know, and that's fine. But think about all the ways we, that you use the internet. It's, you know, it's, it is basic infrastructure now. Yeah. It's that one wire that delivers like free speech or free press freedom of association, access to tools and education and civic and political engagement, everything we use to measure a civilized society. So EFF, we started here in, in the US. I used to be EFF's European director and I know really well that we have uh, contacts and we do work all over the world. We have uh, colleagues in Germany and in South America. Um, what about people in other countries? What does it matter to them that, EFF, that uh, the FCC and the American network providers are going to be able to prioritize some traffic over others. Well, one of the things that's actually happening is it's quite interesting if you look on the international stage because other countries are handling net neutrality quite differently and are prepared to be um, a good deal more aggressive than our current FCC is prepared to be. So I think that that's great for people in other countries. They have got regulators that are prepared to really step in and protect the open internet for those countries. But the reality is the internet is international. We all know that, right? And so um, the worry that I have is that precedents that get set here in the United States eventually get followed in other countries, um, not least because companies here in the United States will pressure uh, people in other countries to follow them. Yeah, I mean, one thing we've seen over the years is the U.S. Trade Representative is, a, is like patient zero in an epidemic of crappy internet policy, whether that's <laughs> laws that protect DRM or equivalents to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that, that the U.S. really likes as trading partners to, to, you know, jump off a building with them. Right, that's exactly right. And keep in mind, just as with in copyright, where you talk about, you know, the mouse that controls everything with, with Disney, you know, there's the, the, the ISPs that we're talking about are massive and massively profitable, and they are very happy to spend a lot of money to make themselves even more profitable. Yeah, yeah. Well, so let me remind you, you're watching a live stream from the Electronic Frontier Foundation here in sunny San Francisco. This is Corinne McSherry, uh, Legal Director of Electronic Frontier Foundation. I'm Corey Doctor. I'm a special consultant here, and we're talking about net neutrality. And I'd like to move on to talking about the arguments of net neutrality opponents. Uh, so they say that all the FCC did was roll us back to 2015. And you said earlier that they rolled us back to year zero. Square those two uh, circles for me. Yeah, well, so what they want to argue is that all that happened is that the FCC reversed the 2015 order. Well, that certainly did happen. But that's not actually what the FCC is proposing to do. What they voted on was actually a whole new approach that said we don't actually need prohibitions against throttling or blocking or fast lanes or, or slow, you know, any of those things. All we need is transparency. So we just need for the ISPs to be sort of basically honest about what they're doing and then the Federal Trade Commission will come after them if they're being unfair and deceptive. So that's a whole new approach that is you know, very ISP friendly. And it's not the way we've had it before. What we've had from the earliest days of the internet was a sort of set of principles that just said, you can, you know unfair data discrimination. What the FCC is saying now is we're not gonna enforce that at all. And looking to the FTC to do it, the Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Trade Commission's focused on consumer protection and policing unfair conduct. And that's a fine thing for it to do. The problem is, Number one, let's face it, um, these ISPs are going to have clever lawyers 
that are going to write disclosures that won't really disclose very much. Um, secondly, it's going to be very difficult for the Federal Trade Commission, which is busy policing everything from you know bleach to children's toys to, I guess, now internet access, um, to actually detect what's happening. Even if, and even if they get complaints and reports from independent people, they're really not the people who are best equipped to do this job. The agency that has historically been in charge of internet access is the FCC. So it's really strange that it's just decided to sort of abdicate this, responsi abdicate this responsibility completely. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think about how the FTC might manage this because, first of all, as you said, the FCC has this like deep bench when it comes to understanding telecoms mm -hmm. policy, which is a pretty difficult and obscure subject. But also, you know, the FTC, their, their modus operandi, the way they're mandated to operate is they warn you. And then if you don't comply, then they get to do something. So I remember when Designerware in Pennsylvania was making spyware for rent-to-own laptops. And uh, the rent-to-own companies were spying on their customers with it. They were covertly operating the cameras. They were circulating videos of their customers having sex, their children in the nude. They were plundering their hard drives for interesting music to listen to. And when the FTC slapped them, they said, you are required to stop this unless you put it in your fine print from now on that this is going to be the terms on which you rent to own these laptops. You know, I think we want more than that from, from this one wire that's so important in our houses. Yeah. Uh, so, it, it, you know, one of the arguments that I've heard from Pai and from his colleagues is that, well, if, if, if this were the kind of thing that carers were really interested in, we'd have seen them doing it all the time before that. But there's only this handful of examples that we can think of. Did the carriers do this kind of discrimination in the past, and, and will they do more of it? Yeah, I mean, they've experimented with this kind of discrimination many times, and it's just that we occasionally caught them. But actually, I think one of the reasons that they didn't do it more is because they weren't allowed to, right? We had net neutrality principles in place, and they got slapped if they got caught doing it. But the thing is, what, what, what happened in 2015 is we had actually in legally enforceable prohibitions in advance, right? We had rules in advance, rules of the road that said this is what you can do, this is what you can't do. Um, I think now they're free to experiment as much as they want and um, they just have to disclose that they're doing it. But again, I think you're right. You know, I don't think disclosure is going to be adequate because no one's going to write a thing that says, hi, yes, I'm slowing your internet down. Yeah, right? yeah. It's like now with now with fewer features, it's going to be, you know, down on the small print underneath by like the thing that says by being dumb enough to buy your internet from Comcast, you agree that we're allowed to come over to your house and punch your grandmother and wear your underwear and make some long distance calls. And below that is going to be the thing telling you what their network management rules are. So let's name and shame a little. W which companies were most heavily involved in lobbying for this? Um, all of the household names you already know. I mean, of course, this is Comcast, this is AT&T, this is Verizon. Um, you know, some small ISPs also supported it, but lots and lots of small ISPs did not. Mm -hmm. So, for example, speaking, not naming and shaming, but actually naming and praising, like um, small ISPs like Sonic mm -hmm. um, here in the Bay Area said, we don't have any problem with these net neutrality rules from 2015. We're fine. We're yeah. good. Yeah, I mean, I, my uh, phone provider is a company called Ting, uh, and they own small ISPs across America. They bought up all these little mom-and-pop uh, cable operators and put in fiber loops, and they're definitely very pro-net neutrality. That it's, it's great to, that there are those carriers, but like, it's not like I can get fiber from them. You know, the town I live in, Burbank, it has a great fiber network. They're just not allowed to let me hook up to it in my home. It just, it serves Disney, it serves Fox, it serves Warners. It's operated by the city, but it, I don't get to connect to it in my home with my home business. It's pretty frustrating. Yeah, well, that should change. I mean, that's the kind of thing, actually, I think communities should be experimenting with. Yeah. I would say the city of Burbank, perhaps, should open that up for regular people. Yeah. So, um, is this going to hurt network investment or help it? You know, they said that they said that this was that the uh, twenty fifteen order had held back investment. Are the carriers going to roll a bunch of money into giving us all fiber now? <laughs> uh, I think not. No, what the, the investment argument actually I found particularly frustrating because the thing is that they said the carriers said a lot of things in what they submitted to the FCC and these sort of self serving comments that they um, that they put into the record. But they said a very d different thing to their investors, yeah. which is where they're actually legally required to tell the truth. And when they're legally required to tell the truth, as in their SEC filings, they said, net neutrality rules, the 2015 order is not affecting our investment whatsoever. Yeah, and I think that you know when we think about the investment that carriers make, 
we always uh, zero out the biggest ledger item, which is the actual rights of way, which the cities give them. You know, if you wanted to like start your own ISP and you wanted to negotiate street by street, block by block, house by house for the right to put up poles, to, you know, to run wires into the ground, to do all those things, you would spend trillions of dollars and you'd run out of money long before you finished because the people with the last bit that you needed to cross connect would understand that their optimal rent for their land was your total expected profit minus a dollar. And so, you know, th this is a, a common problem. Economists understand it really well. I mean, when Disney bought all that land in Central Florida for Disney World, they kept it a secret. They had all these shadow companies, these front companies, because they knew that if, if word got out that, that the prices would go up and up. And, you know, we get, uh, the public, we give the carriers all of this subsidy. You know, the only one company will get the cable franchise for your city. And we ask them in return to give us some public value. And I think that's a fair deal. You know, if they don't want to offer a public network that offers the public what the public wants, that when you click on a link, you get the page, then they can run their own network without the public subsidy. They can pay those rents for, for all the sidewalk. But uh, until then, I think if you t if you take the public subsidy, you should offer the public's network, right? Well, this is a thing where that I think um, people should be looking at very carefully over the next year because one of the things I think that's going to be happening is that um, state legislators are going to be looking hard, and local you know representatives are going to be looking hard at how they treat. Um, carriers in within their jurisdictions and that also mean as they look hard at that and look at seeing what they can do to protect their citizens um, you're gonna see pushback yeah and it's the kind of thing that gets complicated and people don't always follow it so it's gonna be the kind of thing we want to make sure we stay alert to so that if state legislators are actually trying to do some good in ways that seem maybe just a little bit wonky it's still going to be worth paying attention because there's just so, going to be so much money against them. And the only way to fight that, we saw this with the fight for broad, um, broadband privacy here in California, um, where we were trying to sort of put in place good consumer pr privacy protections, data privacy protections. And, you know, when you've got a ton of money on the other side, the only way you fight it is overwhelming public support. Yeah, I remember that with SOPA, you know, 8 million phone calls to Congress in 72 hours. It turns out when you melt their switchboard, they pay attention. Yep. Yeah, and, and they say all politics are local. So, um, uh, how do you know if your ISP is messing with your neutral network? It's actually pretty hard, yeah. um, I think, for ordinary people. The good news is... Um, there are lots and lots of researchers um, who are pretty interested in this issue and so, you know, are trying to monitor it as best they can. But it isn't easy to know for sure what's happening with your local ISP, which is why it's so important to actually have rules in advance as opposed to trying to have enforcement later because someone managed to actually detect when they were messing around. I know that we have colleagues in DC, the, the M-Labs people, who've done sure. some pretty good work on that kind of measurement. But this, is, this has been a real problem, is wiring up the internet for like telemetry to figure out when bad stuff's going on. Our, our colleague or friend, uh, Julia Engwin from ProPublica, did this amazing thing where she got her readers to download stuff that told her which ads they were seeing on Facebook. That's produced all this amazing journalism just today this thing about how um, companies are discriminating against older people when they when they um, uh, send out job ads. Yeah, and, I saw that. And Tim Wu did the same thing in New York, where he, when he was with the state attorney general, he gave everyone an open source tool to measure the speed of their network so that he could see whether or not Time Warner's claims uh, were being honored. You know, their advertising claims were being honored. But it's really hard. And obviously, like, it's much easier just to make the companies behave themselves than it is to get millions of people to sit around the edge of the network and try and pounce on them when they do wrong. Well, and that's another thing I'm glad you reminded me of. So one of the things that the FCC is also trying to do is actually make it really hard for state attorneys general mm -hmm. to bring those kinds of claims. Mm -hmm. So the FCC is kind of, in essence, saying, um, if we don't regulate, no one can regulate. We're not going to regulate, and no one else can either. Like, yeah. And I think that's going to be challenged, but that is pretty scary because... I think state attorneys general are going to say, no, actually, we think it's our job to protect our citizens, and we think we can do that. Um, are there ISPs that we can look to that will help us support net neutrality? Um, well, yeah. Um, so there's a couple things. So there's, you know, Sonic is one that I know off the top of my head Monkey is Brains good. Too, Mon here. Monkey Brains is good. Yeah. But there's also um, a group of ISPs that submitted comments for the record um, that they all signed on to that said, you know, we like the net neutrality rules and we want to keep them. 
Um, so, you know, those are the ISPs I would probably, you know, look to, but let's face it, the reality is you live where you live, yeah. right? Yeah. So you're not going to move based on an ISP. I mean, you might, but most people aren't going to do that, and they, that's not an option for them. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I wonder if people will someday advertise in the same way that, like, in London, property that's near a, a tube station is worth a lot more because being able to get somewhere has some tangible value or being near a good school i wonder if being near a good fiber loop will eventually be a thing that realtors start to look at i think that's actually exactly why cities are getting interested in this yeah. because they want to be able to say like we're a connected city we're connected means many things but you know what we're a city come here yeah. invest here because we're actually going to provide real infrastructure for you to build your business I think that's been the, the South Korean soft diplomacy pitch for 15 years. Uh, South Korea, land of gigabit, you know, the land of imminent nuclear threat and gigabit symmetrical broadband. Right, right. You know, and I think a lot of people in our circles weigh the two of those and go, imminent nuclear threat, gigabit symmetrical broadband. Eh. Well, you know, it actually is like, it's a disgrace. I mean, this is the one thing that's kind of fallen behind it. It's not exactly a net neutrality problem. It's just a problem, which is that our broadband investment has been pathetic. But it's not because these companies don't have the ability to do it. They're sure. just spending their money doing different things. But our speed is so far behind much of the world. It's embarrassing. Yeah, and just to remind you again, uh, we're here at the Electronic Frontier Foundation with Corinne McSherry, the legal director of EFF. I'm Cory Doctorow. I'm a special consultant to EFF. We're talking about net neutrality in last week's order here. Um, so uh, you talked a bit about state uh, um, state AGs and state state houses taking action on this, and it's an exciting idea for me because local politics sometimes are easier to organize than mm -hmm. than national politics. Uh, I worry a little that the only state net neutrality laws we've had so far have been ones that ban net neutrality and ban cities from building their own networks. And I, is there a way that we can think of states crafting a law that protects net neutrality but doesn't establish the principle that in the future, an FCC that made a pro-net neutrality rule couldn't be thwarted by a state house that was captured and that said, we're going to ignore it? Well, I don't think that, that we're going to have a world in which a state can just ignore what the FCC does. Mm. Um, there's certain things that are sort of, you know, going to be federal policy and have to be followed by all of the states. Um, you know, but th this isn't unique to the net neutrality problem. This is sure. sort of in general, we sort of try to think, well, you know, what's, what can a state do? What can a federal government do? A good thing that a state can do, very, very traditionally, is states can protect consumers. Like a lot of consumer protection laws are state law. It's a traditional, yeah, sure. you know, thing that we know states are allowed to do. Um, so, so I think a lot of those same principles are going to apply here. Um, I do think, though, that you're quite right that there's 20 states that have basically anti-neutrality laws in the sense that the state has decided that we're going to decide at the state level what communities can do. And there's different ways in which they sort of try to stand in the way of community broadband. But I think that's going to change. And the reason I think it's going to change is because those laws were passed without anyone paying attention, mm. right? Because they were passed because, you know, a few ISPs basically talked to a legislator and said, could you do this, right? And, and it was the kind of thing which might have seemed a little bit arcane and maybe kind of wonky and, you know, okay, fine, we'll just put this through. No one was paying attention. That's not going to be true anymore. Yeah. Everybody's awake and watching. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's... There's this idea that, like, maybe if things get worse, they'll get better, and we'll, like, this is the thing that always drives me nuts. People are like, well, uh, uh, finally things are so bad that people can't ignore them anymore. <laughs> and, you know, I, 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 in the decade plus of been working with EFF, I've really taken on board the idea that it's much better not to let people come to harm than, than to celebrate the harm. But I do think that, like, there's a difference between celebrating things getting worse or cynically right. sitting there and saying, let them get worse so that people wake up, and saying, well... Now that they're worse, let it, let's not squander the blood and treasure here that, that, we've, that we've lost in this fight. Let's at least salvage from that the public awareness, the, the, the peak indifference that we hit, so that, and use it to fight back. Well, I think that's right, but I also think of it just slightly differently from that. And, you know, in my 10 years working at EFL, yeah. I have grown much less cynical, ironically, than when I started about, you know, the, about the grassroots or mm -hmm. the net roots, or however you want to think about it. I have seen people mobilize to do extraordinary things. And mm -hmm. so, you know, even though obviously with what the FCC did last week is a setback, 
you know, public awareness of net neutrality and why it matters is completely different, mm -hmm. right, than it was 10 years ago. We've got a situation where 83% of Americans, if you ask them, do they support net neutrality, they say yes. Well, five years ago, 10 years ago, if you would ask people, the said, first thing is, like, I don't even know what you're talking about, yeah, yeah. and why does it matter, yeah. and you couldn't even have the poll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? No, like, and you can't can finish the words net neutrality without them nodding off. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I think that the world has genuinely changed. Yeah. And, and, it, and people are really, and also we have tools that we didn't have before to get people mobilized and activated. You know, frankly, mm. it's just a lot harder to do things in the dead of night than it used to be. Yeah, that is that is good news. So, uh, you're the uh, uh, median uh, EFF supporter out there watching this live stream. Uh, what is the next thing you should do? So, the next thing you should do um, is visit our Action Center and uh, and take action. We're going to be, and, and but keep watching because we're going to be mobilizing, mobil, huh, rolling out <laughs> a series of actions for people to take. Um, you can also go to the battleforthenet.com and take action there. You know, get ready because particularly the first few months of the year is when we're really going to get need to get you know millions of people activated, speaking out, and pressuring Congress because of, to do the first thing that I talked about, which is to take advantage of the Congressional Review Act to repeal this whole thing because that's the that would really be the best and cleanest path forward, and it's a. Um, it's, I think we can really do this because so many people support net neutrality and so many people are unhappy about this. What we've heard from people, from staffers in Congress, is they were getting more calls about net neutrality than they were about tax reform. Wow. So this is an important issue and it's an important pressure point. So we need to let Congress know we care about this, the FCC made a mistake, and you need to fix it. Yeah, and that's action.eff.org for people who want to find, who want to find EFFs. Uh, uh, actions there, and then one of the questions we had: if you're if you're a, a non-median EFF supporter, but but someone that we also have a lot of in our constituency, someone who's thinking about doing a startup, what's your lesson from the fact that now the incumbents have to can pay a fee to keep you out of the fast lane? What can you do? I'm not sure I have as much happy news for for the startups. Um, I think you know, it's frankly you're going to have to start build, building it into your business plan. Um, and you know that's really unfortunate. I don't like it. I might you know maybe accelerate things before they put all the bad practices in place. Right. Um, but you know you're going to have to start building it into your business plan that you need to figure out what are, what are the extra fees I'm going to have to pay. That's a that's a tough hard lesson. It is. Yeah. Well, so I uh, you've been listening to EFF's live stream. Uh, this is the Electronic Frontier Foundation in uh, the Tenderloin in San Francisco. This is Corinne McSherry, our legal director. I'm Corey Doctorow, a special consultant. We've been talking about net neutrality. Thank you for everyone who tuned in. Uh, oh, is there one last question yes. coming in? There is. Uh, what can non-US EFF supporters do? That is a, a really excellent question. What should you do if you don't live in America? Right. Oh, so one thing that I'm pretty sure um, our development director would have wanted me to say is that one thing you can do is support EFF and support yeah. our work. And um, so if you go to EFF.org, there's lots of, we make it very easy for you to contribute to our work. And we really appreciate it, whether it's a small amount or a big amount, whatever people can do. It feels really good also when we can grow our membership to know that we have so much support. Um, so that's one thing that you can do. Another thing that, frankly, I would be doing is any, wherever you are, you likely there's some version of the net neutrality fight in your country as well. So you need to get engaged in it, engaged with it as best you can. Um, and you know, you can call Congress as well. They don't, I'm sorry to tell you, Congress cares a little bit more about um, their own constituents than people internationally. Um, but you know, but again, I think what I really come back to is you need to, t you need to work on this fight at home where you are because what happens in the United States can be exported, so you need to prevent that from happening. Yeah, I mean, back to back to supporting EFF uh, financially. You know, Denise Cooper is a, a wonderful open source sort of doyen, and one day she sat down and she said, "You know, I uh, every month add up all my bills and realize that I am giving hundreds of dollars every month to companies that want to destroy the f the future I want to live in, to phone companies that are working to undermine." the net neutrality I care about, to hardware companies that are uh, adding DRM to their products, to entertainment companies that are fighting to uh, use copyright as a club to shut down free expression. 
And, you know, I'm not going to, like, go live in a cave and not have internet access and not use hardware and not consume popular entertainment. And we can't have a popular movement if we tell people you, you can't be in it if you don't like popular entertainment. We won't be popular. Right. So what she does instead is she adds up the money she spends every month on subsidizing the destruction of the future she wants to live in. And she makes a donation in that amount every month to organizations like EFF and the other organizations we work with. And it's a thing that I took on board, too. It's not like the only thing I do, obviously, but I make a big donation to EFF every year myself. And uh, it's because I've, I've been associated with this organization for so long, I've never seen anyone spend money smarter than EFF, and I, and I know exactly how far those dollars that I put in go. And so I think it's a, it's a good investment in a better future. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for all the supporters that are out there on, on Facebook. We really appreciate it. Thanks.